Uh, this one's called The Frocks. And to, in order to honour the story, I put on my uh, dynasty uh, top, which is perhaps a little tasteless, but I didn't care. And it's got two themes that I play with a lot. One is about things that come alive, which you don't expect, and are nasty to you instead of nice, which again, you don't expect. And the other thing it's about is about adornment and fashion and clothes. So there's are two themes that I'm quite fond of. Sarah first became interested in couture in the 1960s. A lot of women's fashion then was designed to make the wearer look spelt. Edge to edge seams, narrow reveres, slim skirts with a kick pleat at the back. Surplus decoration was rigorously avoided at that time. The culture was elegant and minimalist, and it spoke of ladylike good taste. By great good luck, Sarah got a job at a, as a junior at one of the minor fashion houses. But the clothes she made did not speak to her or make her glad. There they lay on the cutting room tables. Bales of sober tweed, swatches of matte satin, serried rows of bone buttons. Sarah wanted to make something that was not allowed. And so, night after night, she stayed behind in the basement. She thought that this might be the engine room of her imagination. And she was right. Every night in the fashion house area in Riding House Street where she worked, the workers would throw out unwanted bits of fabric. There they lay outside each shop. Not for nothing was it known as the rag trade. Sarah flittered from one doorway to another, picking up bits of satin and lace and hid them in boxes. At weekends, she scoured the markets for deck chair cloths, coloured gauze, stripes, woven nosegays and circles. Soon, she had enough to begin. She laid the fabrics out on one of the cutting room tables and was astonished to find how easy her task was. She tried a dress first and it seemed to make itself. The dress had colossal sleeves and she decided to slash these and insert a vivid purple satin interior so that it looked like an Elizabethan doublet. The waist was tight and the bodice was so low cut that her nipples almost peeped out. And the skirt, it was huge and she decided to add layer upon layer of tulle. Of course, it was not exactly easy to wear and it was hardly inconspicuous. Her boyfriend came to see it and remarked, do you really think you're going out in that? But she did and she got stuck in a phone box and had to be pulled out by a passing policeman. Sarah noticed that when she wore the dress people would titter and mutter to each other but she despised them. Valiantly, she expanded her repertoire. Trousers that made of, were made of sailcloth, so hard that it was impossible to sit down, and jackets made of 57 varieties of cloth. The hems and darts were marked out with contrasting threads. Sarah was a walking revolution. Soon she attracted media attention and a sponsor who paid for her to have her own workroom. She had arrived, but where exactly had she arrived to? The frocks she made were outrageously, mellifluously feminine. The layers, the peplums, the frills were dizzyingly excessive in a way that appealed to those who had unacknowledged hungers. People literally fought to acquire an original by Brand Sarah and there were several small riots outside the shops which sold her wares. But then things started to take a very peculiar turn. One day 
the door to one of the outlet shops sprang open and a client stood there screaming, get this bloody thing off me. She was wearing one of the huge frocks and looked like a tiny caterpillar in the middle of an enormous cabbage. The dress could not be taken off. The hooks and eyes were somehow welded together and the built-in corset had invaded the client's ribcage and became part of it. They called the fire brigade at first and they tried with the electric saws and block and tackle to wrest the dress from the body, but to no avail. In the end, surgery was necessary and scalpels were required to rebuild the wearer's body. Things got worse. A phenomenon developed called the Sarah Click. Only some frocks exhibited it. Once they were tried on in the shop and the breasts had been pushed up, the hips smoothed down and the frills fluffed up, there was a loud click as the dress enclosed the wearer for good. Some women lived and died in their frocks. Others had them cut away. No one failed to notice that the discarded ruffles seemed to have a life of their own. The frocks would lay there in the corner of the room, moaning a little and trying to crawl across the floor. Sarah often visited the abandoned dresses when she was alerted to them. What were they, her tricksy darlings? Why did they sometimes kill and sometimes cure? The only answer they gave was a rustle and a sigh. Nonetheless, she took care to sit well away from them. They might devour their mother. I hope you enjoy these stories. And if you did, it would be nice if you could like and subscribe. And also in the comment box, if you'd like to suggest other sorts of stories you'd like me to read, or what you like or don't like, that would be great.